Kalyatram is something which is unique to South Asian dance styles, not even to Kathak, uh, because it, it's starting now, called Ranga Pravesh in Kathak. It's unique, it doesn't happen in ballet or tap or modern or whatever. It's a heritage, Arang Yatram is, and the very word Arang is a stage, Yatram is to ascend the stage. So it's to say that I've completed a course of repertoire in dancing and I'm ready to perform and teach. And really it was, had a very spiritual meaning behind it. As well as that it's got a sanctity, the word Arangetram, the, the event itself has spirituality and a thanksgiving event. So it's believed that uh, at the Arangetram is the opportunity for the dance incumbent to wear their bells, get it blessed, get the bells blessed by the teacher and by other elders as they perceive them in the community. They could be other dance teachers or grandparents, aunts, uncles, parents. But um, you then present an entire repertoire to an audience doing all the pieces by yourself. Here, of course, because there is a lot of exposure children get the opportunity to do one or two pieces in shared performances for quite a few years. And uh, the annual student showcase also has become a part of the professional student life in Britain. So students here, the Arangetram is not the first time they're coming up on stage. But what the training for the Arangetram does is it makes them go through the rigor that demands uh, stamina both um, in terms of your memory, in terms of your physical being. And with most Arangetram students, as a teacher who's put them through, through this, I actually see their artistic development, the way it takes place in the last few weeks or months leading up to the Arangetram. A teacher's responsibility is huge to guide the student in, in the right way mm. and with full sincerity. This, there is a requirement for, for, for sincerity, loyalty, truthfulness on both sides. And a, a student's responsibility is to, is to trust and put themselves at the mercy of the teacher more or less. And it is the, it is the, the teacher's responsibility to live up to that expectation. So that is, to me, that is what the meaning of you know, uh, um, touching the teacher's feet or falling at the teacher's feet. It is, it is being submissive. I am entrusting myself to you. Another side of the Arangetram is the Guru Shishya relationship. Now, obviously, your Guru, gui your guru guides you throughout the whole process. Um, I'm very, very lucky to have a Guru like Srimati Pushkala Gopal, um, who's, a, who's a highly trained expert in Paratanatyam. I mean, she lived her years as a dancer when she was in Delhi and in India, in Chennai. I mean, she was born and raised in Chennai. But um, her guidance uh, was absolutely fantastic because here's a woman who um, who's lived a life of a performer, who's learnt the dance style properly, acquired it correctly from gurus, the Dhananjayans, who are based in Chennai, who have an institution called Parthakalanjali, whom I also went to in my gap year. So her guidance um, was on a very broad level. It was dance technique on one side. Then we had the, um, in Parthanatyam or in Indian dance, we have the use of the face, which is the Abhinaya. very keen to do it because they wanted to uh, take it very seriously about the art. There it is, uh, they are very serious. Only those who have money, they also have, uh, want to show off, they do more. Not all of them do that and it. And it is not compulsory, either there or here. Because at the Bhavan what happens, we do the performances, many performances. It's not important they should do that and it. But if they want to study thoroughly, they will do their ending. Because nearly one year, they have to study themselves, dedicate completely themselves, work themselves and do it. It's not just come, spend one hour with me, perform on the stage, do an Arangetram. We don't believe in that. So working with Guruji in Arangetram was a fantastic experience. I mean, you know, you, you just have to come here every day. You have to be around. So sometimes 
a lot of patience because he wouldn't always be ready for your class or for you or he had a lot of things going on. So you'd have to go away and practice, uh, think about your dance. And if you go back, he might be teaching another class. So you'd have to, you know, so there's a lot of patience building. And I think that the, there's another kind of training going on apart from just the dance with Guruji, I felt with him. And uh, so, so learning, learning the items was really, really important and rehearsals were really important. So there was a point that then you'd have a rehearsal on stage, then another point where you'd have rehearsal with all the musicians. So all of that process was fantastic. I have done Arangetam's 24 students since I came here. The first Arangetam was in 1989. And uh, who done the Arangetam is Anusha then. And she says, teach yourself in London at the moment. And uh, I have privilege to teach one English uh, woman, Susanna Harrington. Um, and she done the Arangetam in 1996. And she has been teacher since then uh, in Essex. Um, few other students I have, they are also teachers themselves, uh, teaching in London um, and they are doing some other professions. And also I have done my daughter Saranka, uh, her in nine, two, 2005 and she is also helping me and assist me all the time. And she is also a teacher and assisting me with me on Saturdays and Sundays. Without your knowledge of the music, I wouldn't have been able to do my own getrum, really, because mm -hmm. I sort of came to Path Biddy saying, I really want to learn your, your classical style, but I'd like to do it as somebody with faith as well, and so I want to be able to do it on a Christian theme, which I know it's not done, it's done on Hindu themes. So without Path Biddy's knowledge of music and her knowledge of people who could actually produce the music for me, I wouldn't have been able to do it, would I? Because I, yeah. my Varnum was a Christian Varnum, and so that didn't exist. And so yeah. without that, I wouldn't have been able to. When I start preparing for a ringetron, I discuss with the students what they would like to do. I see to it that there is variety in the selection of compositions, the theme, Raga, Tala, and also I keep in mind the audience. Some, some parents can tell me that they would have mixed audience. Then in that case, I think of the composition that would be appreciated by most of them. And then uh, once I decide the items, I start preparing them initially one by one. I, I, I teach them one by one, I do the choreographies, and as they progress, I see how I can embellish, how I can improve on every choreography. And then the intensive starts about two, three months before. The last month is really tough. They go through <laughs> extensive training, intensive training. Um, well, for every, every year in Gatrim, you follow a mark, and so like a path, and um, it has set pieces that you do. Like, for example, I did a push Panjali and an Anarapu, and then the Shabdam comes into the expressional pieces. Um, but instead of a varnam, because there were two of us, we did an avarasas, which is like, um, it shows nine expressions and different stories for that, so we could depict them together, um, playing different characters, so that was really interesting. And then in the second half, we did all the expressional pieces, pieces and ended with the pilana, which is um, the usual finale item. I did a pushpanjali, um, and I did boob. Um, a lot of the items I did the same as what my mother did for hers, just because we thought that would be nice. And a lot of them were also composed by Sri Theran Masterji, um, so they're not very well known. <laughs> but um, I did I did the same Varnam as my mother, um, and that was composed by Sri Theran Masterji. And only me and my mother and her teacher have ever done it, so it's like a really special environment, so that was nice. Um, I've been learning since, I don't know, since, <laughs> since five years. Yeah, since five probably, but I've always, since 
I was a baby, I've been watching my mum teach and that's just gotten into my head as well. And um, even the items that I haven't learnt, I actually know because I've seen it and heard it and I can actually sing them off as well because I just know them so well. Um, I done my Angetum in 2005, October. That was a really rigorous kind of experience because a lot was expected of me. Um, yeah, everyone just wanted it to be perfect. I yeah. was doing, I was applying for my university at the time as well. So, um, yeah, that was really hard. But it was very enjoyable at the same time because it helped me get more into dance and I started mm. to enjoy it a lot more. Um, and I used to go to weekly dance classes and, you know, we'd have school performances and things. It was very much um, uh, uh, within the Sri Lankan community. Um, and then when I was 14, I think the natural progression, as in with a lot of uh, these girls, was to have her at Atrium. So um, I had that. I was 14, which is, um, seems like a, a world away, sort of half my life away. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it was a lot of pressure from my parents, like, you should do one, you learn dance for this long. I'm not the best, I'm not the most confident person, so I wasn't too keen in having one. Then as we progressed, I got more and more into it and a bit more confident as well. But um, yeah, the whole India trip was, was a good experience, but I'm not, I'm quite a fussy eater as well, I'm not a fan of the Indian food. <laughs> so, and the heat as well at that time of the morning. But it definitely paid off all those lessons in India and just training every day and going through it. We still did the whole repertoire like every day towards the end of it, which so I built up my stamina as well. So yeah, for the Angich I found it really easy to just dance, especially dancing in the heat there. Like the lights and stuff, you don't find it as hot, so it's useful. <laughs> Saturday morning, waking <laughs> up at eight o'clock, being told you're going to dance school. Painful for a child. Yeah. <laughs> and I came not knowing what I was doing, what I was learning, but my mum was like, it's fantastic. I wanted to do it all my life. You'll love it. And I came to dance class and I saw this wonderful lady in front of me with a duck of gray and a stick. <laughs> it was a scary sight. But... I've got to admit, I did enjoy it from like the first month onwards. Like it took me a while getting into this whole waking up, training. It was like a little regime that you get into. You know what's expected. And Diddy was strict. But bullying was not the right word. She never bullied me, but <laughs> she put me in my place when I used to like to wander off into my own little world. I'd stand there and I'd be like, Diddy's talking and I'd be there playing with my sari looking out the window, what's going on, and she'd be like, Sima, and I'd be like... In the Mangalam, she just falls on her bottom, sits on the stage, loses <laughs> balance, and I got up, and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> it was the end. I actually, I mean, I was so excited, and I couldn't believe that I didn't. And also, to top it off, um, two weeks before I got into a car accident, I was in the neck brace. Yeah. And I remember you and mum going, well, you have to do it. <laughs> you have to do it. Because you'd called um, the percussionist and the veena player from India. from India. And she was like, the tickets are paid for. It's all been done. They're going to come on the plane. You have to do it. And my mum was like, I've taken a loan out for this. You have to do it. <laughs> and I'm in a neck brace going, okay. <laughs> I couldn't move my neck. It's always been my granddad's dream to see his grandchildren or someone in the family, you know, doing and really going all the way with Bharatanatyam because he, he goes to lots of Arangatrams and he's, you know, chief guest and everything. And he's always wanted someone in his family to do it. And I think as you grow older, you start to really enjoy the dancing as well and you get a connection with your guru and that's something that really wanted me to, you know, make her proud and make the family proud and give me a sense of accomplishment as well. 
and yeah, and I think also it's because I mean I went to India and learned from a different teacher as well, and they don't put in that much emphasis on actually understanding what you learn. It's more just learning it than do it, learn, do it. Whereas like Geetha Ji actually explains it to you, and especially because I've lived in England my whole life, I didn't really have much of an understanding before I probably came here, and it's and even beyond that, like it's kind of a way of life now. The way I walk, people always say I walk like a dancer whatever that means, um, and whenever people come home, um, they, they ask, they just sing a song, and they say, like a traditional song, they just say, do the expressions, and I can, because now I understand the language better, yeah. what facial expressions to use, and you're just familiar with all the, uh, the songs, the language, the culture, the yeah. way you dress, you know, being decent and <laughs> modest, and things like yeah. that. Um, well, I learned lots, lots of stuff about the dance as well, and um, I think after my Shalanga Puja, I had to do an English GCSE speech to the to my English group, and I talked about Bharatanatyam, and I used that because I've I knew a lot about it, and it was it was a chance for them to know about it as well, and they were all quite interested in it as well. It's kind of brought forward what we uh, our culture is like, so. I mean, people, other children who are born and brought up in England might not know different styles of South in uh, Bharatanatyam and all the different Indian types of dancing. But we've we had to learn all the different types of dances from all the par all parts of India. So it has helped us. We've learned more about the religion, me and Ashikan, <laughs> because well, we, we didn't, didn't really know much about Hinduism in, before. But in all the songs and uh, bhajans, there's meanings to the songs, and we have to learn them so we can perform it correctly, it looked like a story that's being told. Um, so we have to learn all the, uh, that, that was also a lot of stories about the gods, so we learned a lot from that as well. You see, father, we live away from India, we cling to our dance, our traditions, our music, and our cultural heritage. So you can see that, go to America, they do bhajans and they do, they are more into uh, arts and culture. Uh, activities. So for Indians, I think they take it for granted. Or they, it's yeah. part of their life. It's, it's, so when you live in India, you don't think so much about it's it. Around it. You don't yeah. take it an extra effort. They get the culture to work. You don't take that conscious effort in India. It's part of your life. The girls go to dance class every day. They go to music class every day. So it's normal. But here you have to take that extra effort to go to dance class or to take your child to class and uh, take the children to shows so that they appreciate our traditional culture. It's so rich, it's so rich, it's so deep, it's so complex that you know even just learning a small aspect of it imparts them with so much of the culture whether they do it for a few years, whether they then go on to perform in a patron or whether they do it simultaneously even with ballet. My daughter was learning ballet for a while, stopped and it so happened that she seems to be more getting more into Bharatanatyam and Carnatic music whether it's genetic, whether it's my influence to a large extent that I'm doing it with them. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, but it's given them more of an insight into Indian tradition as a whole. Not only just the way we celebrate festivals and other things, but this is... This form of art is like an ocean. The deeper you get into it, you get so much. If you want to learn more, you want to learn more, you aspire for more. So it is like that. It's so rich. Our culture is rich and this form of art is like I guess it's like any five year old dream just to be on stage, have the attention on you. The costume, the jewelry, the makeup, I guess that's what really, I'm being honest, just just pulled me into this art form. But by the Nardium specifically, just the beauty and the eloquency, just the beauty of its art just is so, so attractive and I felt that that was, that was always going to be a dance form that I was going to do and um, yeah, yeah, but what I feel like the best thing about our engagement is it's not actually about the day, it's about how long you've been dancing, like for an engagement, it, even though it's the beginning of the end, if that makes sense. Um, you've been preparing for it for a really long time and the journey is just so nice. Like, you go through so many ups and downs that it's just really different to whatever anything else you experience. It makes you appreciate dancing even more. Mm -hmm. and 
um, makes you want to dance even more. Mm -hmm. Some people stop after the hour each but all of us have continued mm -hmm. afterwards and, and we just, we're working towards different goals and we've all got different things that we're working towards and it's something that just keeps us going in our week and uh, apart from the normal school and work and everything, we just, it's, it's a nice thing to have going at the same time. Well, even if you don't think of pursuing it as a professional thing, it's still, you know, it's still something we regard that high. Yeah, and I, I don't think the Iron Ocean was just like about the dance. I think the whole experience like makes you mature as a person. Because before I was, I don't know, I think I was quite childish. And like now after the Iron Ocean, I take dance more seriously. And it, it means much more to me now than it did before. And you appreciate it much more after the Iron Ocean. And that's good for us dance teachers because in terms of uh, uh, keeping up the traditional work when there's so much pressure outside to just keep doing new things, the, the importance of uh, the traditional art form's growth um, really sustains the dance teacher in terms of their relationship with their peers, their teachers back home in India, but now if you come to East Ham or Wembley um, or Tutti, you can find um, that you can buy traditional bells, you can buy costumes. But the jewelry should be a temple jewelry. Normally, that's the culture we wear the temple jewelry. Um, and when it's come to makeup, we, some students they can do by themselves. Sometimes we have a proper makeup artist. From my meeting, we had a proper makeup artist. <laughs> From all other pictures, we have some. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I have a professional makeup artist to do the makeup for our engagement. Yes. Before that, we arranged for a photo shoot. During the photo shoot, we decided as to how to do the makeup and what sort of makeup and what sort of um, hair do we want to do. Uh, much before the photo shoot, we, we considered the costumes. How did we go about it, Rahul? Uh, I think obviously there's always been a tradition in terms of the costume and temple jewellery as written in the dance books like Abhinaza as in the style of how you should prepare yourself for a performance so with that in line of tradition um, I think usually we would go to India to stitch the costume um, for your measurements because there isn't really um, a tailor here that can prepare a costume to that standard so as far as I know anyway so Usually, you know, there are, we go to India, we, we stitch the costumes, you purchase a sari, um, essentially, that you really like, um, and then that sari is then made into a costume for your measurements. Uh, and you also there, you buy the, um, the temple jewellery. Um, in India, obviously, you'd have the original sort of jasmine flowers, but we're not able to, to get that here and for it to last. So we use sort of paper flowers as a resemblance of the the true, true jasmine flowers? For me, and I think that's the case for my, uh, you, you know, my attitude towards the students as well, the costumes and all of that is an, an, an additional thing, it's not the main thing. Main, main thing was dance. Um, I don't know what you mean by did I choose it carefully. Uh, it wasn't that I got costumes done especially for Arangetram. I had some costumes and um, I think I only had about two then and uh, my, my teacher lent me one and I wore hers, adjusted it a bit. Uh, you know, money was tight and uh, the focus, like I said, was dance. It's the culmination of such a long journey and such an intense relationship with your teacher over a long time and I think when you're doing work on a commercial level that time is obviously less that you work on something it's not going to be 10 or 15 years worth of work on one show there's a real reverence given to um, given to what it is you're doing and why everyone has come there together and that's because of your dancing. And that's because of all the work that you and other people have put into making that day happen. And so it isn't a ceremony that happens all the time. It's hopefully just, and probably just a one-off in your lifetime. The idea of Arangetram is, um, is quite different now. Certainly in the, in the kind of British 
uh, outside of the UK con or India context, mm -hmm. not UK, India context, because, um, you know, Arangetra means the first time you ascend the stage. And even within the Devadasi system and other systems, you know, I remember the story, and I'm sure it's, uh, you know, when they would have learned their Alaripu and um, Shabdam, perhaps, when they do their Shalanga Puja, that's a Arangetra. I mean, it's nothing like what it is now outside of India. And you were saying, yeah, the solo is not about your identity. And in a way, it's even today when you're doing it's not about mm. an identity, mm. it's something quite mm. different. I mean, yeah. certainly it's not about your identity. No, it's, it's, there's, no there's no community identity for me in, in Baranasim at all. And, and, you know, and I sometimes kind of fight against this sort of image that any Westerner doing Indian arts is sort of trying to be Indian in some way. It's, <laughs> it's not. I came to Indian arts through going to very high-level performances, mm. um, meeting particularly in North India some, some phenomenal performers. And, and for me, um, Bharatanatyam was the dance form that just sort of fitted me best in yeah. lots, lots of respects. Absolutely. We sort of had a solo performance as a kind of target, yeah. but as you as you said, it was, it feels now at the moment not so much the goal. I've, it's very much the process and the journey, mm -hmm. which I didn't feel when I was, you know, when I was fourteen. I was just, you know, it was just willing it to. <laughs> it was hard finish. work, but I just wanted the day to happen. Um, but now it's a lot more deep. And when we 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 have classes, as we as you said, we can discuss. Hindi philosophy or, you know, mm. Anish has lent me a lot of her books, sort of Natya Sastra and Abhinav mm. Darpana and really going deep into mm. the, the understanding of Bharatanatyam, which was my own really nice break from it. <laughs> <laughs> I, the year before I did my own Getram, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to go to India. It was on a kind of course for people from all over the world, so there, it wasn't just full of Indian dancers, but I went there because I wanted to go and I'd never visited India, so I wanted to see India. And one of the nice things was that I visited the uh, Chidambaram temple, where Lord Shiva was supposed to have come down and performed. And I was doing a dance in my Arangetram then, about Lord Shiva dancing in Chidambaram. So like when I was starting, I was like, oh, I've been there, I've been there, oh my goodness, you know, oh! <laughs> so it made it more sort of meaningful then, because I'd seen the place where Shiva danced, and then I was learning about this dance about him performing there. And so it sort of brought it all together in my mind for me. I feel that uh, whatever the case is, and I think in, in Britain we have a um, floating population all the time. We have people come from India, Sri Lanka, everywhere. And so there is clearly a need for Bharatanatyam. And as long as there is a need, then it is a very positive sign for, for this art form to sustain longer. And it has sustained all these years. You know, we're talking about 2,000 years, really. And if it's, if it's sustained all these years, and uh, of course times are changing as well, there are a lot of experimental work going on, you know, like, uh, especially in diasporic communities where uh, you want to experiment with the, the current dance form that is going on in that country and all that. Uh, all that is healthy, I really support that, and, uh, but at the same time, having, you know, ha had this form with us for all these years, uh, I think Arangetran really contributes for that, you know, particularly for that. And even in India, I believe uh, this this idea of solo performance is slowly uh, fading out because more group work and ballet and that sort of a thing is coming up. So, uh, Arangetan definitely, whatever happens, like you said, you know, some, some of them don't continue. But for whatever reasons, at least you, we have a what about 15, 20 Arangetans in a year, you know, in Britain alone. So. So, th so that that will definitely be a an inspiration for the younger generation, and uh, I'm sure it, it has a long way to go. You know, maybe another two thousand years. <laughs> <laughs>